Well, thank you very much, uh, Mike, and um, it's lovely to be back at the National Honey Show and see so many uh, familiar friends and faces uh, in the audience. I'm beginning to feel as though I know almost everyone that keeps bees in the United Kingdom. Uh, having travelled all over the country to all the different local associations now uh, since the early 1960s. I ought to start this off in the time-honoured tradition, I think. Um, you'll all be uh, familiar with uh, the chorus's introduction to Henry V and the world uh, of uh, monarchy. Um, oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. That's the sort of image that comes into our mind uh, when we think of royalty, kings and queens. Unlike social creatures, we control our population by war, <clears throat> by disease and by famine. I've always thought that human beings are very intelligent, but not intelligent enough. Um, this is the view of monarchy that most human beings have, the old despotic sovereign ruler. But the queen is not a monarch like this at all. This is a Ligustica queen from a New Zealand stock. She has all the characteristics you'd expect of a queen, but you're looking at a minor miracle of biological engineering when you look at this bee. She's not just the continuation of the ancestral female bee that roamed the earth 40 million years ago in the Eocene period in the genus Electrapis. The ancient female bee has been modified in two directions. The genome has been modified to produce queens, and the same genome has been modified to produce workers. The queen is not a natural female because she can't forage for her own food. The worker is not a natural female because she can't lay eggs, well she can lay eggs, but she can't copulate uh, to produce fertilized eggs, so she's unusual. So neither of these two sexual polymorphs, the worker and the queen, are uh, natural compared with their uh, ancestral origins. The genome has been modified in one direction to create the queen and in another direction to create the worker. When you think about it, that's truly spectacular because it's the same genome that is being used to produce two entirely different sexual morphs. Uh, when you read newspapers nowadays, you tend to get the view that um, if you've got a gene, you'll get the characteristic that the gene is designed to produce in your biological chemistry. But here you see that's not true, because it's what food is fed to the larva that determines what happens to the genes. It's true also in human life. Our genes don't operate automatically. They need environmental triggers from our food supply usually. But there are other environmental triggers for a gene to actually operate. It was Jean Savarin who coined the phrase Dites-moi ce que vous mangez et je vous dirai ce que vous êtes. Tell me what you eat and I will tell you what you are. What you see in the honeybee is a unique piece of chemistry. If we understood how the genes in a larval uh, honeybee are modified in different directions to produce a queen or a worker, we would be much, much closer to using gene therapy to cure human diseases. So there's a wonderful area of research there for people in the future. Now, the other wonderful thing about the honeybee is that she's a unique member of a very, very small group of species that have formed societies. In the original forms of life on the planet Earth, say 2,500 million years ago, you start off with single-celled organisms. Then you get a mutation where some of the single-celled organisms can stick together. And when they stick together and don't separate, you get organisms being produced. And the honeybee and the human being are both organisms. So 
An organism is really a society of cells where division of labour has been uh, evolved to give different cells different jobs within the body. When you get a cancer, what's happening is a single cell is escaping the control systems of the organism and going back to its free living state. So it replicates when it wants to, irrespective of the environments, and it migrates through the body looking for new environments, just like an amoeba would in a pond today, because we still have single cell animals or single cell forms of life out there. So what's happened in social biology is a continuation of the same phenomenon. Once you've got organisms, pressures develop in certain key species to associate the organisms together to create a supra-organism, which is a true society. And we see that in ants, bees, wasps, termites, mole rats, and I don't include human beings at the moment because I think of human beings as herding animals aspiring to become social. Uh, and we've got quite a way to go uh, before we can sink individual views uh, truly in favour of the common good. So one of the first things that the true insect societies have done is that they control reproduction. Mankind's greatest problem is that we're overpopulated and in 2050 it will be difficult for us to find the drinking water and the food uh, and the energy uh, to maintain everyone without polluting the environment so dramatically that we will damage the fabric of life upon which our own existence uh, depends. So I use the term supra-organism because I believe it's the best English term to describe what happens when a society truly coalesces together and becomes greater than the sum of its individual parts. In America, um, a very famous entomologist coined the term super-organism, but that's not quite the right English because superman is an enhanced man with enhanced properties, but he's still a man. Supra, as a prefix in the English language, means over and above. It's not just an enhancement of an individual, it's the creation of a new form of life. And I hope to show you during the lecture that we are copying that process. We don't yet have queens as such that are very obvious to identify, but if we want to build a society, the first thing we will have to do is regulate the world's human population. Otherwise, we will end up in complete anarchy, fighting all the time over food and resources. So the queen honeybee is a unique sexual morph designed for the uh, control of the total population of the colony. But she's not in charge like Queen Elizabeth I. If you watch a queen walking across the comb, it always reminds me of a time I was at a, a Buckingham Palace dinner, um, garden party and you get a crowd of people and then the gentlemen at arms wearing pink cravats walk into the crowd and then they walk backwards to create a lacuna, a space, and then into that space walks a member of the royal family and starts chatting to people. And you'll see that on a honeybee colony. The workers draw back, inviting the queen to come into the space as they direct her towards the cells where they want eggs to be laid. She is literally wheeled around the colony. Once a queen is mated uh, she, and is therefore valuable to the colony, she's never allowed to fly out on her own again. If she walks towards the entrance, she'll have her legs bitten and her head buttered until she moves back. But when she's a virgin queen and she's not important to the colony because she's not fertilised, she can go out for a flight any time she wants uh, during the first three weeks. In fact, if she's very reluctant, uh, she'll be chased out of the hive. If we look at the face of a queen bee, it's quite different to the face of a worker, which is more triangular. The beautiful face of the queen is rounded. I think I've spent too long with queens, haven't I? <laughs> when I look at them, I think they're rounded and beautiful. Um, and uh, part of the rounding is caused because you can see that the uh, mandibles here are sharp and they're not full of little pummelers. Uh, as they are in a worker bee for manipulating wax, and the tongue is short. And I've been all over the surface of honeybee, workers, queens and drones, 
uh, photographing and measuring all the different bits and pieces all over their bodies and then I've worked through the internal anatomy and through the brains to compare them and uh, there's virtually nothing in a queen that is the same as in a worker. It's truly remarkable. For example, here are the mandibles and you see the mandible is incredibly carefully designed. It has to be used to cut the queen uh, out of her cocoon at the end of her development, but it's got a little spoon-shaped structure which you can't help feeling is for holding a liquid of some kind. Uh, and it's got this very unusual structure here. It's a very specialised implement. It was Adam Smith in his book The Wealth of Nations many years ago who clearly explained the value of division of labour. That if you have a task to perform, for example a manufacturing task, if you break it down into separate subtasks and you let each worker specialise on one subtask, they become incredibly efficient at doing that. So what you see in a honeybee colony and what we have yet to develop in a human society is such a level of division of labour that you get really increased efficiency and effectiveness in every job that you do to survive. So what you're looking at at the Queen is a Formula One sexual morph that's been designed to do very, very specifically what she actually does do. And she truly exemplifies Adam Smith's concept of the division of labour for the maximisation of efficiency. Look at the hamuli that hook the back wings to the front wings. On a queen, they're slender. On a worker, they're really tough. A worker has to do an awful lot of difficult flying through difficult conditions, <coughs> carrying heavy pollen loads, so she has a very strong hook to hook the back wing to the front. The queen is not going to fly many times in her life, and you don't get the same investment of time and energy in creating uh, the stronger hook. If you look at the sting of a queen, the barbs are held close to the sting, so that when a queen attacks another queen, uh, she can work the sting into the body of her adversary uh, using these barbs as levers because they're ultimately, of course, evolved from an ovipositor that was originally used to insert eggs into tissues um, uh, and that required a considerable leverage to drive the sting in. And only subsequently has it been used for attack or defensive purposes. If you compare that with a worker, you see the barbs in the worker are pulled out so that they will fasten in the tissue into which the uh, uh, sting has been placed. So the queen can sting and withdraw her sting without any problem. So she can sting multiple times in a fight with another virgin queen. But the worker deliberately, uh, in an evolutionary sense, leaves its sting behind in a mammal like a honey badger uh, or a human being that's attacking the hive for the very specific purpose that it wants to identify and mark the aggressor. So when the honeybee pulls away and leaves her sting sac behind, the sting sac is releasing isopentyl acetate which then marks the intruder for all the other bees. So they know exactly who's causing the problem and where to sting and where to attack. I always say to beekeepers, you don't want your beekeepers to get to know you. You should wear a different aftershave every time you go to them uh, so that they don't remember that it was you that smashed up their brood last time. Uh, because beekeepers used to say to me, how do, how do I get my bees to recognise me and know that I'm a friend? Um, the truth is you are never a friend. You are the honeybee's oldest enemy. If we look in the brain, here's a brain cell, makes big decisions in a bee's brain, this particular one, this is the Kenyan cell. Here's the nucleus that contains the genetic information, just like ourselves. And here you can see these little uh, organelles, as they're called, uh, in the cytoplasm. These organelles are modified bacteria. They're symbiotic bacteria that joined the metazoan uh, animal uh, organisms during their very, very earliest of evolution because these are mitochondria and they are absolutely essential for the conversion of energy that's ultimately uh, 
been uh, originally been obtained from the sun, that has to be converted into chemical energy. Uh, once a molecule of glucose is obtained uh, by the uh, cell tissues of a body, whether it's a human or a bee, and hydrogens are taken off the glucose and they're brought to these little mitochondria. And the mitochondria have a unique piece of chemistry uh, whereby they can take the energy that uh, is linked to that uh, hydrogen atom and store it in a little molecule called adenosine triphosphate, which is a chemical store of energy for the rest of the body. But what's interesting about these uh, bacteria that live in our cells and live in all honeybee cells uh, is that they contain their own DNA. So they replicate and they age and they live their own little bacterial life uh, all the time. You remember recently there was a, an article in the press that said that a human being was being created by in vitro culture from three parents um, because they knew that three parents were involved in the production of this child. But the newspaper people didn't, re didn't understand this, the science behind this, and they actually promoted the idea that this child was a chimera produced from three human adults. Now, the truth is that the human DNA for that child came from a male nucleus and a female nucleus in the normal way. But the mother was carrying mitochondria that were deficient in their DNA. So they got a, a third person, a woman who had healthy mitochondria with healthy DNA, to contribute her mitochondria to the new child. And that was a completely successful operation. And the child would not have been able to live without that, those mitochondria from the third donor. So she got two lots of human DNA from a mum and a dad, and then she got some bacterial DNA for mitochondria from a third person. So it just shows you how much you can have uh, questions in Parliament and discussions in Parliament about the morality of producing a child from three parents, whereas really they weren't, she, they, she wasn't being produced from three different sets of human genes. She was only being produced from one set of human genes. Why this is relevant to us is that the mitochondria here age, and as they age, they're brought into a large dustbin system here called a lipofuscin granule, which gets bigger and bigger and more complex as the brain ages. You get exactly the same granules in a human brain. And the mitochondria are broken down and converted into layers of fat. This is of particular interest to me because I did a, a, a long project with Pamela Munn, who used to be editor of Bee World, looking at aging in bee brain. And we found that if you took an old, seven-week-old summer bee, and compared the lipofuscin granules in its brain with a winter bee that had lived four times longer round to January, we found that the rate of production of the lipofuscin granules was magically extended. And when we looked in queens, we found in queens the life aging process had been also expanded. So it wasn't that, that the queen had her aging processes arrested or the winter bee had its aging processes arrested. The chemistry of aging was just extended. So I'm very interested in that because, again, it's probably a very similar system to the one used in human brain. And it would be lovely to see how brain uh, aging can be extended uh, simply by varying the chemistry. And this is a fantastic marker of the biochemical aging of a brain cell. And there you can see it uh, marked out. Incidentally, you can see where the impulses from this brain cell go off because they travel down this little wire here and they send commands down to the nerve cord to fly, to sting, to walk. So this is a decision-making, managing director type cell in a honeybee brain and the impulses are just like the impulses in a human brain. We also have in Queens uh, a unique virus. This is the queen filamentous virus. It's as big as a tobacco mosaic virus. I don't think virologists generally know about it because it would be a wonderful virus to do experiments on because it's so big it's as big as a bacterium. If you compare it with sac brood virus, which I've also got on this slide, you can see how big this filamentous virus is. It's a huge virus and we ought to be doing some virological research on that because it's so accessible compared with these tiny little sort of 30 nanometer type viruses. Now here's a flower that thinks it's a queen. 
because this is a bee orchid and evolution has sculptured a shape and appearance that is just like the female of a particular species of bee. It might be a bumblebee or it might be a carpenter bee, but it is so perfectly arranged and there's usually a scent that matches the pheromones of the queen that it's, that it's evolved with. And of course the male lands on here to copulate, his head picks up the pollen uh, in little pollinia baskets here and then the, the male flies off to another flower like this and pollinates it. So here you've got a flower that's pretending it's a queen that's endowing pollination properties on a male. There is nothing stranger than fact. Whenever you find something amazing in fiction, I can guarantee that, you, that in the biological sciences we can show you something uh, that will make you marvel uh, when you look at absolute fact. Here is a worker bee that thinks it's a queen. Because in Apis mellifera capensis in South Africa, we have one of the ancient uh, varieties of Apis mellifera. It's a subspecies, of course, it's capensis. Um, and its particular properties have been bred out by evolution from all the other Apis mellifera colonies. In Apis mellifera capensis, if you take the queen out, the oldest worker assumes the role of the queen and she starts to produce substances like the queen pheromone and the workers gather around her and create a court. She then starts to lay eggs and miraculously these eggs have not come from a fertilization process. They are parthenogenically produced eggs but they are diploid and therefore they can be raised into new queens. So this is a colony that can requeen itself when you take the queen away, cloning, using cloning, parthenogenic cloning of female uh, larvae. Um, but that is such a problem for bees because it inbreeds the bees. And I'll show later on that inbreeding uh, to produce queens is disastrous for a honeybee colony. And so Apis mellifera capensis is the only subspecies of Apis mellifera that lives today that is still hanging on to an extensive amount of female parthenogenesis. So we'll have gathered from that that the whole reason for sexual polymorphism and for copulation in the first place is to shuffle the genes. Because if you shuffle the genes, you will generate variety in the offspring and you can offer to the environment a range of different characteristics. And according to Charles Darwin, the environment will select the variety that best fits at that moment in time. It will then reproduce again. So gradually the whole population changes its characteristics over time. Um, whenever I give this talk to students, they all sort of start murmuring at this point. Uh, and I always think, hmm, you thought sexual polymorphism was for some entirely different reason, didn't you? <laughs> there are some strange facts associated with honeybee reproduction because it is so spectacular. The drone a queen mates with is not the father of her sons because she's going to produce her eggs, un uh, her sons from unfertilized eggs. And all the sperm from one drone should be genetically identical because they're not produced by the normal method for producing uh, sexual gametes, which is meiosis, which reduces the amount of DNA in the cell. They're produced by mitosis, which is incredibly unusual in the animal kingdom. That's why it's a good idea for a drone to die when he has successfully copulated, because there'll be lots of copies um, of his genes and he'll have made a big contribution to the next generation and so it's actually beneficial to the population for him not to go around delivering the same uh, genes to every female in the vicinity. Now sex determination in bees is completely different because in bees you have a sex determining gene which has about at least 20 common alleles. An allele is a form of the gene so in humans, you might have a blue eye allele and you might have a brown eye allele sitting at the locus of the gene for determining eye colour. So they're just different forms of the gene. So in bees, if you get two different 
sex-determining alleles, you will be female. If you only get one, you will be male. Since the normal drone is produced from an unfertilized egg, it's only ever going to get one sex allele, so it becomes uh, male. Um, one of the disadvantages of only having one set of chromosomes is that if you have a recessive gene, it's likely to show. Whereas if you've got two copies of the gene, as a woman has, for example, with her X chromosomes, a recessive gene on the X chromosome is not likely to show because she may have a dominant gene on the other chromosome, just as brown eye will dominate over blue eye. So it's the drones in honeybee colonies that tend to show all the recessive mutations that the females are carrying, which are hidden by the fact that they've got two genes for every action, and often they'll have a dominant and a recessive. And I was sitting in my garden, well, I was down by the beehives at the bottom of my garden, and my daughter Francesca reminds me quite regularly because she was there, and I saw a bee flying in looking very strange on the flight, so I immediately reached out and caught it. And I looked at it, and it was this bee. And you see it's only got one eye. It's a cyclops bee. And I knew about these in the literature, but I didn't think they could fly. And this one was actually flying. And it's a recessive mutation, and it's being shown because it only has one set of genes. And if the recessive uh, gene is there, then it will show it. So why is inbreeding such a problem? There we've got a drone, and we're going to cross this drone with a queen that is closely related, because this queen has two sex-determining alleles, and one of them is the same as the drone. This is a disastrous situation. The drone can only produce one type of sperm, carrying XA. The queen can produce two types of eggs because she's producing her eggs by meiosis. So she's cutting her genetic information into half and she's putting one sex allele in one egg and the other sex allele in another egg. So let's look at the combinations. If this sperm meets this egg and fuses, it will produce an XA larva. And that will automatically be a worker because two different sex alleles determines the development of a female sexual morph. But if the drone sperm meets this egg, it's a 50-50 chance, you'll produce this one. And because it's only got one type of sex allele, although it's diploid, it will still be a drone. The worker bees, nurse bees, recognize that condition and they will pull the larva out and eat it. So if you've got this inbreeding in your colony, half the brood that should have been workers will be diploid drones and you'll have pepper pot holes all over the uh, brood comb as the workers keep pulling out and then larvae and then bringing the queen to lay more eggs. So your colony cannot build up its maximum performance for honey production or for disease control or anything. Your colony is completely ruined uh, by having uh, diploid drone production occurring. Friedrich Ruttner at Oberursel uh, near Frankfurt um, actually took sperm from a diploid drone because he kept the workers away so that they couldn't eat or remove the larva and he reared it using artificial supply of food and got the adult diploid drone and of course it still produced its sperm by mitosis so all its sperm was now diploid and he coupled that up with another uh, gene uh, with the same allele and produced a triploid drone. Uh, you couldn't go much further because the cells were, uh, weren't big enough to hold the amount of genetic information that was getting stuffed into them. Well here's brother Adam who uh, is definitely one of the kings of apiculture and the kings of beekeeping. And we always used to take our students regularly to him uh, to talk about mead making. It's usually mead making and then queen rearing uh, uh, was the student's preference. Um, and one of those students is here in the audience, David Blackwood, 
uh, who will remember these trips. And uh, you see Brother Adams explaining here the value of a two-inch feeder that keeps the uh, liquid warm so that the bees will rise in cold weather and feed. Whereas if you get, get the feeder too deep, so the bees have to come up six inches, they're much more reluctant to come up to a feeder in cold weather. And then you get fermentation of the food. Many of you may recognize this lady. Her name is Elsie Widdowson. She is the queen of nutrition. She designed the wartime diet. Um, she became a companion of honor for all in recognition of her services to nutrition. She injected virtually every nutrient you could imagine into her own blood system. And her scientific partner, Robert McCants, uh, took all the measurements on her as she faded out. I remember she included aluminium she injected into herself. She still lived into her 90s, but she did so many experiments on herself because she felt that was the only ethical thing to do. And you can read her book. It was a book by McCanson Widdowson, which explains the composition of foods and is the fundamental book for most dietitians in their training. The Medical Research Council Centre on Nutrition at Cambridge is named after Elsie Widdowson. Uh, and the British Nutrition Foundation, where I worked for many years, uh, Elsie was the president. And so uh, I picked up some great tips from Elsie. And for a woman who knew so much, her advice about diet was very simple. She said, you just eat a little bit of everything and not too much of any one thing. And the reason she said not too much of any one thing was that reduced your risk of being poisoned by contaminations or malfunctioning industrial processes or methyl mercury in tuna from marine pollution, etc. And I still follow Elsie's guidelines. A little bit of everything, not too much of any one thing. But of course, Elsie had a younger sister. And that younger sister was Eva Crane who is undoubtedly the queen of apiculture, both in her time and in living memory. And both of these ladies were true scholars. Elsie devoted her time to nutrition, and Eva devoted her time to beekeeping, since she was given a swarm at her wedding. Uh, Eva was a particle physicist by original training, and she gave it all up just to work on bees for the rest of her life. Two outstanding women, both queens of their subject in every sense. Here is the egg that we used to produce a queen. You're all familiar with standard queen rearing techniques, so I won't dwell too much here. But we used to use 50% royal jelly mixed with 50... Well, we built a solution of royal jelly mixed with 50% distilled water because that, when you put the larva on that uh, mixture, uh, the larva settles more naturally. Because if the bees detect the tail and the head pointing towards the entrance, they uh, automatically remo remove larvae in that position. And that's probably because normally that would indicate a diseased condition. But when they've actually accepted a transplanted larva, you see they build a rim around the queen cell, and you see it's a darker colour than the white wax behind. So they're adding chemicals to this rim. And I think in those chemicals, they're telling the nurse bees whether to keep the cell or not to keep the cell, whether to feed the larva as a queen or not. So I think there are all sorts of interesting pheromonal signals being built into that rim, and that's yet to be explored properly. Here you've got the queen cells coming through. Here the workers have cleared the wax off to make it easier for the queen to get through. And here you've got the queen being cut out of... And you can produce 80 queen cells in a colony if you've set the colony up properly. Of course, it's good to make special bits of equipment. And these are the observation hives that we built at Cardiff so that we could really get into the lives of the bees. And you see here there's a, a perspex wheel which allows you to get to any part of the comb to remove a queen or add a queen or manipulate the cells. That's what they looked like in actual... Uh, and one day I took uh, the laying queen out and I watched how the bees selected the cells that they were going to turn uh, into queen cells. And I watched the whole process through and you can easily do this in your own local association. <clears throat> and when the first virgin queen came out, 
instead of just being fed and wandering around, in the first hour, she located all the other capped queen cells. And she went, she put her head upwards and her tail downwards, and she hugged each capped queen cell, like hugging a tree, and she listened. And then she went to the next one, and she went all around the observation hive doing that, and then suddenly she detected some movement inside. So she made a mark on the side of the cell and injected her sting, inserted her sting, and killed her potential competitor before she could even get out of the cell. And she did this for all the other cells. And I think the reason I saw that behavior was because the observation hive was very small, the colony was very small. It couldn't support swarms with lots of queens, for example, uh, going out one after the other. It could only support one queen replacement. And the workers were not keeping her away from the queen cells. I think in a big colony, the workers will keep a virgin queen away from the other queen cells so that they can get several queens out and have a little bit of insurance for requeening. And here you see, in a queen rearing colony, you can see that <clears throat> there was a natural emergence here and all the other queen cells have been destroyed. And here's a cell that wasn't taken up. So the violence in honeybee life seems to be largely restricted to the violence between virgin queens trying to take over a colony. Uh, most of the other time, of course, violence in a honeybee colony is usually about defense. Although it is true that if the drones outstay their welcome at the end of the summer and the colony is nice and happy and doesn't need the expertise of the drones, then they will be thrown out very ruthlessly. This is a slide rule that I developed in 1978 and is still sold by E. H. Thorne. So let me take this opportunity to thank E. H. Thorne Limited for sponsoring my talk today. I knew Les Thorne very well. I used to visit his home. It was full of pianos and organs. He was an extremely competent man. And I know he would be thrilled to see how that business has grown uh, under the guidance of Jill and Paul. This slide rule can be used for all sorts of manipulations and planning. Here we're trying to synchronize the mating of the queen with a particular colony of drones so that we can get a preferred mating in an isolated mating site on a mountain or on an island. So I've, I've turned the rule around so that it identifies these two flying periods for the drone and the queen. Uh, that tells us then that the eggs for the queen need to be laid here and the eggs for the drone, because it's a different development time, need to be laid here. So using a slide rule like this, you can calculate your whole queen rearing program and your queen mating program. Uh, and here we see it in action uh, for working out uh, the uh, quality of a queen. Uh, this is this year. So on the 12th of May, I split a colony. I harvested the queen cells on the 18th and the first queen emerged on the 24th. So I now swing the slide rule into position, and if I work backwards from the first day of arrival, I can see that this was produced from a one-day-old larva, the very best possible start for a queen in development. If she's produced from two-day-old or three-day-old, then her qualities as a queen uh, diminish for various reasons that I haven't time to explain today. Um, so we can look at that queen now. Um, so these Welsh bees are black, so they absorb a maximum amount of energy from the sun in flight. And we can just look at a, a time lapse of this. I've run it on time lapse so you can see the queen from different directions. Okay. And you see she's very dark. She doesn't have any yellow sections to the segment. She's a very locally bred bee. She can survive very bad weather. She can fly in very cool temperatures. And she has good uh, disease resistance. And you'll see when she goes a little bit higher in the frame. that even on a side view, you can see the size of the abdomen. Some people accept virgin queens that have a very narrow pointed abdomen because they know it shouldn't be very big 
because the queen, the Virgin Queen, is not producing eggs yet. So they expect it to be small, but you shouldn't under expect the Virgin Queen body to be small because if it's maximally full of functional ovaries with lots of ovarioles tubes for producing eggs, to be a real mass producer of eggs, your Virgin Queen should still have a very substantial abdomen. Uh, in the absence of that, of course, you look at the width across the thorax to give you an indication of the strength of the bee and the size that she's likely to become eventually. Uh, here we've got the death's head hawk moth, Acherontia. And you see it's got the skull motif on the middle of the thorax, which gives it its name. This is one of the very few animals that can walk into a honeybee colony, steal the honey, and then get out without being attacked. And you can't understand why until you get really close to the colony and listen. And as she goes in, she makes a sound. Beep, 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 beep. Beep, 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 beep. And the worker bees stand back. Whoa, -ho, there's going to be a fight here. <laughs> so she mimics the Virgin Queen challenge call. And that makes all the worker bees leave her alone. And she walks through, grabs the honey, and walks out. It's just amazing what goes on uh, in biology. Here you see a queen in flight at a mating site. Mating sites are quite specific. They're often about 30 foot across, about 100 foot high. And how the bees recognize those positions is very difficult to be sure. I asked Nico Koeniger at Oberössel how he found queen mating sites. And he said, well, you take your wife out for a walk uh, along a hillside and you sit down on a hillside where you can see valleys converging because the valleys converge and air rises, which supports the copulating couple. Or you can find them over pig sheds where there's a lot of corrugated iron and hot air rises. If you look on the inside leg of a drone, you'll see some special hairs, which I call fishtail hairs. And they pass through the hairs on the queen's body and lock and then pull upwards. And that's what gives the drone its amazing ability to clasp the queen and copulate and fly at the same time, which is quite testing. So the special fishtail eggs there. I think if we applied the same level of examination to human beings before they were allowed to procreate, uh, we might be able to improve the genetic fitness of the human species. Uh, because the queen and the drone have both had to have all the right genes to fly up to seven miles, to sustain copulation in flight. The queen mates with up to 14 or more drones. Uh, to get as big a collection of genetic material as she can. Uh, oh, perhaps I shouldn't promote that in, there, uh, in university circles. Um, and then fly back home uh, with maximum genetic content to mix with her own. Once they are mated, the behavior for fighting goes. And here you see these queens quite happily chatting to one another. And you can keep several queens in a colony, provided you introduce them uh, correctly. And two queen uh, hive beekeeping was very common in different parts of the world. And these are two totally different strains, of course, a Ligustica strain and, and a local British bee. Well, I'm going to end just with a few comments on sexual polymorphism, which is really based on evolutionary theory. I was extremely lucky as a young student because I was given access to all Charles Darwin's personal papers. I read all his letters for, to, from his sister and to his sister, Susanna. I looked at the papers that Gregor Johann Mendel sent to Darwin, but he never read them. I looked at the original copy of Das Kapital that was sent to Darwin and inscribed by Karl Marx on the front page, but he never opened it. If you examine the book, you can see, for reasons which I haven't time to explain now, that it was never opened. If he had opened them, he could have added genetics to his understanding of evolution by natural selection. The chair that I'm sitting in here is the chair in which Darwin actually wrote The Origin of Species that was published in 1859. He was born in 1809 and died in 1882. And the stick that I'm holding here is the stick that he used to walk around his favorite walk at Down House when he was thinking up his ideas and his theories. So for me, Darwin is an exceptional person. It's very, very difficult to look at a person and determine their true biological sex because you can't look in their brain to see how they're thinking. Uh, and you can't necessarily see uh, all their necessary external features. 
But here's the alpha female and here's the alpha male. And here you've got the 15 sexual morphs in between. The middle group don't reproduce at all. They're spending all their lives raising or creating the environment in which the reproductive children can survive. And you as beekeepers will see the significance of that immediately when you look at the evolution of ants, bees, wasps and termites. So we can identify the intermorphic group. The wonderful thing about, so what I'm really saying is that eventually I expect out of this collection of genes and genomes will come one or more worker human beings with very specific capabilities for specific tasks in the society of the future, the supra-organism of the future. I don't think that any of us would probably like to live in that supra-organism, just as a caveman would not like to live in our society, because it's so robotic and so restricted and so unnatural to him. Uh, but this is what seems to be happening as a biological phenomenon. But the wonderful thing is that each of these sexual polymorphs can still experience the greatest of human achievements, which is the ability to love and the ability to be loved.